so I'm Allison Bolin. I'm here to talk to you about what's the buzz with machine learning. Um, if you came here because there's a pun in the title, I hope you won't be disappointed. Um, so I worked on this project uh, during my bachelor's degree uh, at Grand Valley State University. Um, my direct advisor, our machine learning expert, was Professor Jared Moore, and our subject matter expert was Professor Jonathan Engelsma. We were able to access Beehive uh, data through a nonprofit called Be Informed, uh, so thank you to them. I'm going to give you guys a quick outline of what I'm going to talk to you about today and what I hope you take away from the talk. Uh, so first, we're going to go through what the problem we addressed is and how we wanted to solve it. I'll give you a quick basic understanding of what machine learning is and how we process through projects with that. Uh, we'll go over the data, because the most important thing in machine learning is the data set you start with. Uh, Pre-processing the data, the hardest, most boring step. Um, how we trained and tested our model, what we did, uh, how well our model did, uh, our next steps with the data that we currently have, and how you can help. So we, uh, my sophomore year of college, I was looking around and I was like, hey, are there any extra projects I can do on the side? Because chess and checkers are all fun and entertaining, but let's do something with Python and not Java. Uh, so I reached out to my professor and I was like, hey, you do machine learning. I want to do something that's a little bit more in depth. Uh, so we decided to reach out to our Professor Engelsma. Uh, and let's save the bees is what we came up with. It's pretty ambitious for a sophomore to do, but I think we can do it. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of what's affecting the bee population. Uh, our subject matter expert summarized it with the three Ps, so pathogens and parasites. The number one killer of bees from what we've researched is varroa mites. They're probably number one through nine as well. Um, poor nutrition is a big factor, so part of our modern society is we have monoculture farming agricultural practices. So big regions of the United States will farm corn for one year or soy for one year. And that really affects the foraging biodiversity for the bees. So if something happens to the crop, they really don't have much else to feed on. Um, as well as uh, shifting climates, global warming, climate change. Whether you believe it or not, it does affect the bees. Um, another cool thing that we have going on with our society is the use and control of pesticides. Uh, one, it helps us protect our crops, but two, it doesn't really uh, diversify and target a specific set of insects. Uh, so it will kill off the bees either on contact or worst of all, bees will contact a plant that's covered in pesticides and then bring that contaminant back to their hive and that will kill down the hive. Um, so these are a couple that are still legal in the United States, but there are nonprofits out there working on getting them covered. Uh, so what is machine learning? With the information that I gave you guys, keep that in mind. Uh, we wanted to approach this topic with a machine learning viewpoint. Uh, so through Inform, Be Informed, we were able to get a data set uh, and work on that data set. But before we get more in depth on how we approach this project and the solution we came up with, I want to give you a quick understanding of what machine learning is in case you might not already know. So first, with machine learning, the most important part is you start with a data set. You'll take this data set and you'll split it into a training and test set. Um, you want more, uh, you want a bigger training set than you do a test set, but you still want them to have diverse examples of patterns. Uh, with this training set, whoop, did I go a step too far? I wanted to step too far. There's secrets, guys. Uh, so you'll select an algorithm, whether that be linear regression, neural nets, uh, genetic algorithms, stuff like that. There's a whole swath of them. Each of them are very special in which uh, solution you'll come up with. So people in the medical field want clear, explainable solutions. They'll go with decision trees because they're pretty much a flow chart. Uh, neural nets are a big ball of mystery. Uh, so people in the medical field usually avoid them because you can't explain the results that you get. Um, this is just B stuff, so we decided to go with linear regression as a starter algorithm. Uh, so that's what we selected, and we uh, pre-processed our training set, so we cleaned up all the data, put some statistics in there, added some data fields that we derived. Um, and then with your model and your training set, you'll train that model on your training set over and over and over again. You'll validate again your test set over and over and over again. Sometimes this is really boring and annoying, but it's very important for your end product. Uh, so you'll train and train and train and validate and validate and validate until you get happy results. So something you're expecting or something that's, hey, we weren't expecting that, but now that we see it, that makes a lot of sense. And then you'll deploy a model. And that's where you'll be like the bee's knees of your friend group. Uh, and you can be like, hey, guys, I'm the expert on this stuff because that's definitely how I got myself here. <laughs> um, so we were actually able to successfully deploy a model uh, that can correctly solve the solutions that we were looking for. 
Um, so first I'm gonna describe the data set we had to start with, because how your data set is formatted actually shapes how you can solve your problem. For our data, again, as I mentioned before, thank you, BeInform, for access to your data sets. Um, what they do, so there are citizen scientists across the United States and across the world. Um, they'll sign up for a program where they can have scales set underneath their hives. So these scales will collect uh, data every 15 minutes um, on the weight of the hive, the temperature, the humidity, and a couple of other proprietary information. Um, and with that data, we can uh, have farmers go in on that data set that day, and they can write, yeah, we harvested honey, that's why you see a decrease in 60 pounds at 1 p.m. Or, yeah, it snowed last night, don't really know why, but it's the Midwest, so it happens. Um, and you'll see a gradual increase of like five pounds on top overnight, and then a gradual decrease of five pounds while it melts away in the morning. Uh, it's really cool the way these have configured. So when you go out and check your bees, the hive will actually connect to Bluetooth via your phone and upload it to the cloud application they have so that your data is stored over a long period of time. Um, and this helps with beehive management. So as we were looking through this data, our initial super cool idea was to have a machine learning model go through all these data points and self-select like, hey, Mar Meredith, it looks like maybe you did a harvesting event August 1st at 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Were we right? So that was our initial goal. We got to look at this data set and we realized, wow, this is crap data. Because <laughs> uh, Meredith doesn't really annotate her notes very well, so maybe we, there was a 60 pound decrease in August, but we don't know why. We probably can infer that it's honey, but we can't know for sure. So a lot of, a lot of the data sets we found there were like two or three really well annotated data sets by like Steve, so good for him. Having, uh, yeah, really thanks Steve. Uh, but the rest of our data sets were kind of empty or they had specific dates that had good annotations but the rest of the year wasn't super great. So we had to work around this. And this really affects how your machine learning model can function. If you start with bad data, your model's not gonna behave very well. So for us, is our final solution that we had anticipated to get done we couldn't get it done anymore. But it's still something that's feasible if we write a model that can improve user engagement with the hot. So if we write a model out there that processes your data and says, hey, looks like you lost 60 pounds today, or maybe you gained five pounds over the past couple hours. Can you tell us what happened? And then they'll get email, email notifications that annoyingly remind them, hey, looks like you did something. Can you please tell us what it was? Um, and this will help us improve our data collection and annotation over time so that in future iterations of the project, we can actually get a model that can predict what happened. So our short-term goals, improve data quality over time by improving user engagement over time. Um, we want to be able to predict an event of time that an event occurred, not necessarily what that event was. So it could be anything from harvesting hunting, adding supers, and supers are more boxes in case your beehive grows bigger than you expected. Uh, adding food, so most of the time in late fall, people will add food to their hives since there's no more blooming flowers. Um, you'll add food to the hives so they can survive through the winter. Uh, rain, bricks, so sometimes it gets really windy and maybe the top part of your hive flies off. You can add bricks on top so it doesn't fly off. We had a couple annotations like that. People were not happy when that happened. Uh, so our pre-processing step, we had a lot of messy data for a couple of years. So 15 minutes every day for two years is a lot of data to pre-process. Uh, what we did is we used pandas and SciPy, or not SciPy, SciLearn, SciKitLearn, that's what it's called. So we had pandas and scikit-learn to pre-process our data and train our model. Um, we decided to think about it first as humans. So cool, we have this hive. They are taking data from spring to fall, which is the main season for them. And we looked at it as people and we were like, all right, so what are all the interesting data events that occurred here? And we marked them in green. So we as humans can look at this instantly and be like, yeah, looks like we had something interesting in the spring, a couple of points there, definitely something interesting in the middle of summer and a couple of points in the fall. Now, what we know as humans is, yeah, obviously something happened, and definitely in August looks like it's a harvest event, and definitely in the fall looks like they added food. But can we tell a computer to look at it that easily? That's where machine learning comes in. So machine learning is all about detecting patterns in data and being able to re replicate and detect them in the future. Uh, so how we wanted a computer to think about this, now computers looking at that graph would have a really rough time anticipating and understanding what's going on. So we thought it would be easier to train against normalized data. So we brought all of our data points down and centered around them zero. 
And all these green dots down here, you can see correlate with the green dots on the previous graph. Uh, so we set the computer and the model to look for a threshold, and we use linear regression because linear regression spits out slope lines. And you can see sharp changes in slope on a line based on threshold values down here. Uh, so all these spikes are where dips or valleys occurred, uh, mountains or valleys occurred in the last graph, and this is way easier for a computer to understand given a linear regression model. Uh, we additionally, not only do we want to pinpoint exactly at 1.35 in the afternoon, Meredith did a harvest event, we want to predict an event of time, a window of time where that occurred. It's interesting, so we use a little bit of machine learning to predict an annotation, or to predict an event, an exact point of time, and we did a little post-processing to be able to detect a window of time. So maybe you did it exactly 1.30 in the afternoon, but maybe you did some other stuff to the hive where it's, we got a little bit of fluctuation beforehand. Uh, so you'll see a decrease because people will be taking hive uh, supers off, um, or you'll see an increase, maybe they added more supers, stuff like that. You'll see a little bit of fluctuation in that time. We also want to flag those events so that farmers can annotate them. Uh, so we create a window. I don't know if you can see it really well, but there are green window frames all around these green uh, dots. So we wanted our computer system to be able to detect and create those on their own. So that's our pre-processing step. Those were what were the goals we hoped for. Training and testing. Again, we trained with linear regression, which is as simple as scikit-learn.linearRegression on your data set, so that was super sweet. Um, the hard part was validating that it worked. Now, since not only, didn't, not only did we want to be able to detect an exact point in time, we wanted to create a window of time, so it was really hard to get your model and automate the testing and validation of that, so I had to go by hand with all of the models and validation sets that we had and grade them on a scale of good to not so great. Um, so it was really interesting, so I'm going to have you guys do this step with me. Um, I know audience participation can be a bit iffy at software conferences, but we're going to try. Uh, give me a thumbs up, a sideways, or a thumbs down. So we're going to look at points one, two, and three here. We, as researchers, thought, you know, looks like something interesting is going on with point one, so we hope that our computer can flag it. Looks like something really interesting is going on with point two because there's missing, there's a big drop in data there. But it doesn't look like three is super interesting. It's just a continuous uh, line down of data. So, uh, as you can see, we still have weight on our uh, feature set line and date on our bottom line, but now we actual ha actually have notation marks of where farmers actually put annotations. So all these red crossbars down here are notes that a farmer put down saying that something happened. So it's super cool that we as researchers looking at our data set could predict you know, it looks like something here with number two is interesting, and it looks like number one might be interesting, but it wasn't super interesting to the farmer. And we definitely can agree that number three wasn't interesting at all. So next, we sent this through our computer. And as you can see, uh, our computer produced windows and annotation events that it thinks should have occurred. So all these gray crossbars down here are predictions the computer came up with. Uh, all the yellow crossbars are window frame of time, which we also noted in green stripes. Um, so if you thought that number one should have been an event predicted by a farmer, I would have said, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. But no farmer has said anything about it. But our computer was able to do it. So our computer thought, you know, it looks like something may have occurred here. We're not really sure what, but I think it's worth noting. It definitely did detect what the farmers annotated, so you can notice that in all of these red dots, except for these two, which I'll get to in a second, we're actually annotated by our computer. It said, hey, looks like something's going on here. Can you please tell us what? But it did also completely ignore number three. Uh, so that's super good. You don't want emails every day for every event that ever occurred. Can you imagine your inbox? That'd be horrible. Um, but we did realize post uh, too late in the process, so right before we actually deployed a model, when you end up with time intervals with no data, which is obviously something you want to be aware of, uh, we forgot to account for that in our model. But we realized it's not really a machine learning problem with that set. This is just an if statement. If you have spots with no data, tell your farmer to go check their scales. Maybe they ran out of batteries. Um, cool, so our result set. Uh, again, we wanted a model that could predict events that a farmer could pick up. We wanted a model that didn't predict everything because your inbox would be horrendously ugly. And we wanted to be able to see um, events that were kind of interesting that could be flagged. 
so that's what we wanted. We, wanted we didn't want any overfitting. We didn't want any underfitting. And a hopeful requirement is that some things that did look interesting were actually flagged. So that, that some things kind of are interesting was the part that was hard to automate testing for. Uh, so that's why you need a human eye. So we needed to get a human eye in there, which was me doing the grunt work, because, you know, undergrads. Um, so we went in there and we looked at it and we were like, yeah, 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 these all look super great. So out of the 306 models we were able to create, about 25 were of actually good quality. Uh, one of those 25 is actually living in a computer program out there working on live data for bee farmers. So that's super cool. Thanks. Very excited. This is my favorite project, guys. So definitely come talk to me after. I love it. Uh, but unfortunately, only 8.1% of our current sample space was affected. Uh, it was interesting, though, because the feature sets we trained on, we mostly focused on weight. We could definitely include temperature and humidity in future models. And we only trained on two feature sets. So super cool thing I found in Python was iter tools. And they let you do combinations. So we had a l originally about 13 features we could train on. And I just sent through combinations of those feature sets and trained 306 models. Um, we could have definitely increased that to three, four, or five, but as math theory goes, that would have been a lot of do by hand, and we were not about to commit that in two years. Uh, so let's go over what bad models look like. Now imagine you're Meredith, and you're kind of not doing very good with your annotation, so we end up with a re result set like this, and a model sending you emails every day during your summer vacation being really annoying, giving you lots of homework to do. That would be miserable. We don't want to interrupt anybody's vacation time. And we also don't want anybody's hive to get stolen out from underneath, underneath them without them knowing. So we want to be able to annotate and catch all these events. These aren't super great models. That one overfits, and this one definitely under underfits. But some good models we did get. If it will go to the next slide. Uh, so this one on the left is super cool. It catches all three of the events that we thought uh, farmer annotated, so that was super cool. And it also catches all these interesting points over here. Um, so as you can see, this farmer only cares about the summer season. This farmer cares about the summer season and a little bit of the winter. It was really interesting because we had to work with the results set where some farmers preferred summer seasons and some farmers didn't. Um, so you can see this set also catches all of our red annotations and it catches a little bit of extra. It doesn't catch the missing data, again, that was our mistake, but future sets will fix that. So our current machine learning algorithm, we use linear regression. We definitely probably could have used something like quadratic regression or a neural net. Um, though with the looming date of graduation and running out of funding, um, we couldn't test in time before I graduated. So we have actually uh, more undergrad students working on this project now. And I'm excited to see what results they come with. We had 306 models. We definitely could have had more. Each one of those 306 models was validated on six hives. Uh, which you saw, those six highs were our test graphs that you just saw. Our current model in use is using absolute difference from half day average and difference from half day average data set values, uh, which are based off of the normalization graph you saw first. Our model does predict the events that farmers did annotate, and it does predict frames of time in which uh, an event could have occurred, as well as interesting events that didn't actually get annotated. Uh, so our current state, we currently have a model out in production with Be Informed. Um, as far as I know, it's doing well. I haven't gotten any email updates recently, so it's not doing bad. <laughs> uh, predicts, it predicts when an event may have occurred, and it identifies a window of time in which a uh, series of events may have occurred. So maybe you did some harvesting and you also added a super. We want to be able to see it in the hive. The tools we use, so we use scikit-learn for the machine learning aspect. We use Boca, super finicky, but super cool. That was, uh, Boca formed all the graphs you just saw. We used AWS to deploy and test. We used Python 3 to get our code up to speed. We used Jupyter Notebooks for initial research and pre-processing. Um, Python 3 for scripting and then uh, parallelizing all those model generations. It was super cool. So originally it was like taking four days to get through all those three, 306 models. And then I parallelized it and it took two hours and I was like, woohoo, science. Uh, so that was super fun. Um, I would like to say thank you guys for coming to my talk today and learning more about bees. Thank you, Pi Io, for having me. Uh, thank you, Be Informed, for the data that you gave us. Uh, the Kinchy family for the generous funding of my uh, Captain Crunch late night uh, code sessions. <laughs> and then Grand Valley State and the School of Computer Information Systems for their great support and um, Professor Jared Moore for advising me. 
what you can do to help. So maybe you don't have time to eat Captain Crunch and code all night long. Um, but maybe you got a green thumb or just want to know about what flowers to plant and put in your neighborhood. So in the Midwest, these are very native flowers uh, that are very good for bees. Um, I happen to like sun drops a lot, so when I buy a house someday, those are going to be everywhere. Donate to your local bee charities. Uh, buy local honey, which tastes way better than store-bought, might I add. Um, plant some flowers. Reach out. If you want to be a bee farmer, it's not that difficult, and it's super fun. Uh, so definitely reach out to your hobbyists in the area, um, as well as uh, if you have other good uh, uh, code for good projects that you want to work on, definitely do it. I'm not an expert in machine learning, but we have something out in production. So I hope this talk inspired you uh, to go try some new things. Um, thank you so much for coming out today. I don't know if I'm running over time, but I would love to talk to any of you guys out in the hallway. I don't know if we have another speaker coming on. I don't want to take any time. Oh, hey, cool, cool. So I can take some questions if you want. Any questions? Uh, so we have actually, um, I was able to run it on my Mac, which was not super great for my Mac, but it did complete in two hours. We did put this on our supercomputer at Grand Valley State University. I don't actually know the hardware requirements, but this wasn't super intensive. It just had to go through and touch each data point. Hi, yeah. So it was really interesting. Um, one of the most important parts of machine learning, and the question was how do we deal with outliers? Um, one of the most important things is machine learning is to have a good quality data set to start with and a high quantity data set to start with. We didn't have either. So we had to work with the best that we had. So we didn't have as many outliers as you would expect. I mean, the most outlier is the one dude who only cared about the summer events. Um, and our model did handle that pretty well. Uh, but unfortunately, the whole solution for this section in this project was to improve data quality and quantity in the next round that we deploy. Uh, but it's super promising that we can actually predict window event frames. Um, and the next set will just be like, cool, looks like this weight signature is this thing. Any other questions? Hi. Yeah, so actually we had a bunch of sets of scripts. Oh, sorry, my computer just definitely went to sleep. Um, the parallelization, I believe there are two libraries out there for parallelization. I think I used the pool threading library. I don't remember. It's been a while since I looked at the code. Um, but I can definitely get you more details on that. I have the code on my computer, so for sure. Um, but it was super interesting. We had a bunch of different scripts. So there's a model generation script, a validating script, a graphing script, stuff like that. Our model generation script was actually pretty fast. It was our scoring script that was like, hey, what do you think of this hive? That one took a lot to process. Um, but yeah, I can definitely talk with you more about that after the talk. Any other questions? So it was it, that was the part that was hard. Is uh, for us, we initially thought, wouldn't it be great if we could just write a program that compares the ratio of events and events that actually occurred in window frames? Um, that's super cool and all for things that farmers actually predicted. But again, our data set had events that occurred that nobody actually annotated. Uh, so for us, we had to go through and hand look at these hives against the validation set and be like, yeah, looks like that should have been something a farmer noted. Uh, and we had to make sure that our hive did pick that up. So we couldn't automate it just yet. Um, we're hoping that in next future iterations, possibly next year, we'll be able to automate testing. But for now, it's all by hand. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you guys for coming to my talk. Have a beautiful day.